Hello Coursera, my name is Ronnie Neff and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to talk with you about the Farm Bill and Food and Farm Policy and where health fits into all of that. And you are getting a hot off the presses lecture because um, after delaying installing since 2011, Congress just passed a Farm Bill just about a week before this lecture was due to go live. So I am re-recording it and this is all completely updated. I would just note that due to the need to get this lecture recorded and to you in record time thanks to the several snow days. I'm recording this at home so if you hear some cats in the background I apologize. If you hear fighting children consider that a metaphor for what's been going on in Congress. The title of this talk is U.S. Agricultural Policies and the Farm Bill. Where is health? And my name is Ronnie Neff, and I'm the Program Director for Food System Environmental Sustainability at the Center for a Livable Future. I'm also on faculty in the Departments of Environmental Health Sciences and Health Policy and Management at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. My interests include food system environmental sustainability, food waste, and of course the Farm Bill, as well as food security in Baltimore. I've been editing a textbook on food systems and public health that should be coming out later this year. I'm very excited about that. Historically, I became involved in the Farm Bill of 2008. I actually moderated phone calls for a loose coalition of people focused on a set of public health priorities within that Farm Bill. That was actually the first um, public health venture into the Farm Bill per public health, to my knowledge. And I've been engaged in this Farm Bill as well, both through policy activities and through um, authoring and editing and serving as a reviewer for a number of uh, briefs and policy pieces and a health impact assessment that I uh, served as a reviewer for. And our other colleagues within the Center for a Livable Future, Becca Klein and Bob Martin, who now directs policy programs here at the Center, have been very active as well on the Farm Bill, as I'll discuss some later on. I also previously led the American Public Health Association's Food and Environment Working Group. So in the first section of this talk, I'm going to just give you some broad overview that the Farm Bill is one of many policies that affect food and agriculture. And then the bulk of this section will focus on the history and the context for the Farm Bill, and also why some of that history is also very relevant for other types of policy approaches to addressing food and agriculture. In the second section, I turn to what's actually in the new Farm Bill, and I walk through that making connections with public health. And then the third section is going to talk about Farm Bill politics, including the role of public health in advocating for public health oriented policy within the Farm Bill. So. In the next two slides, I'm going to run through some policies that affect food and agriculture outside of the Farm Bill. And as you can see, there's a very broad range of policies um, at the federal, state, and local levels. At the federal level, I would just point your attention especially to the Child Nutrition Act, which is coming up in 2015. And this is an important opportunity for those who are thinking about the food system. Um, and also to the dietary guidelines for Americans. The USDA's Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee is currently considering um, approaches for the next set of dietary guidelines and there's an opportunity to weigh in through public comments. Um, at the state and local levels I would point you to the existence of food policy councils which are collections of stakeholders within often um, localities or states that come together to address issues of joint concern as well as to build communication across these um, groups that often haven't communicated that much in the past and really work together to change an area's food system. And through food policy councils as well as through um, just directly making policy, there are all kinds of policies that go on at the state and local level that affect food. And I would say that that Often the state and local level is considered a really valuable laboratory where you can um, test out new and creative approaches and you can um, develop new policy. Whereas at the federal level, especially lately, as I'll discuss, it's been pretty hard to get new policies through progressive policies and, um, well, any policy really. 
I would encourage you to think about ways that you can use state and local policy to address food and to address agriculture. So here's lists of just the broad range of policies that affect agriculture. At the federal level, I would point your attention to trade policy because that's something that's um, particularly timely as well, um, where the proposed trade policy could affect um, agriculture in a lot of different ways from um, labor standards to the ability of countries to make decisions about the kinds of, of agriculture and, and food products that would be acceptable and so on. Regulation of feed additives, regulation of biotechnology, labor standards, a lot of different federal types of policies. And then at the state and local levels, um, a lot of policies that can um, promote local uh, agriculture, um, uh, urban and peri-urban agriculture, as well as policies that are really needed, for example, at the planning level to really consider what what does an area need to have a um, an effective agricultural system or an agricultural distribution system or um, to have a resilient food system in the face of threats like climate change. There's a lot of different types of, of um, policies and the Farm Bill is one. It's a very important one and the reason that I focus much of this lecture on it is first of all because um, it has such broad reach so it's so if I just focused on policies affecting us in Maryland that might be a lot less of interest to those of you who are based elsewhere whereas the Farm Bill um, affects the whole country. Now I know some of you are not in the United States um, altogether. I think that some of what I'm saying will still be relevant for, for where you are and for thinking about ways to use policy to address the types of needs that there are in a food system. So the Farm Bill is a broad omnibus bill which means that it has a large variety of pieces within it. And it's really the most important um, and, and largest piece of legislation affecting farms, food security, food, land use, rural policy, and a lot of other pieces. And that's, that's another reason why I really focus this talk on the Farm Bill in particular. It's reauthorized every four to six years, in theory. So the Farm Bill will um, set broad policy, but then each year there's a need for appropriations to allocate money for a number of these specific priorities within the Farm Bill. So you can't just pass a Farm Bill and then, um, you know, go do something else for the next four to six years. You have to kind of be on it annually. So what is the Farm Bill and what's in it? So when a lot of people think about the Farm Bill, this these types of images may be what comes to mind, um, particularly public health people, or they may think of something like this. Or they may think that the Farm Bill is affecting priorities like these, and in fact, um, all three of them are correct, as I'll discuss. And for a lot of people, when they think of the Farm Bill, they think of something like this. Um, this is a, a concept model for the many ways that the Farm Bill may affect obesity, global warming, environmental degradation, degradation and other adverse health effects. And actually, this is a system framework that's useful in systems analyses, but it really does demonstrate some of the incredible complexity of what's going on here. Another way to think about it that I find helpful is to really break it down into five key domains, five key reasons why the Farm Bill is a public health bill. And my, the, my talk in the next section is going to um, break these down in terms of the content of the Farm Bill. But it affects food security, it affects what we eat, it affects environmental sustainability and environmental health, and because it affects environmental sustainability, it's also affecting food security over the long term. It affects equity, and then it affects rural income, quality of life, and rural public health. So I want to give one more piece before I turn to the history, and that is considering why is there a need for a government role in agriculture? So there's all kinds of industries, and many of them don't have a um, big policy like the Farm Bill that um, shapes their activities so heavily and that um, leads to so much governmental investment in these kinds of ways. Um, why, why is there a need for a governmental role in agriculture? Should we just get the government out? And here are some reasons. From the farmer side, um, the farmers have a really tough job, as you've probably heard in other lectures for this class, and one of the reasons is because they're dealing with tremendous unpredictability. So they don't know what the weather is going to do. They don't know what pests are going to do. I mean, you can think about this year right now. 
if you're a California grower dealing with the drought, if you're growing citrus in the south, if you've got livestock that may have been killed in the early snowstorm this year, um, they're dealing with a lot of unpredictability and that affects um, both their ability to make a profit and to stay in the business as well as their desire, frankly, to stay in the business if they can't sort of have some way of assuring their financial stability. Um, farmers are also not nimble in the face of market fluctuations. So if um, in some industries, if the prices go down for a product that you're producing, you could just shift your production. But in a farm, you've probably set yourself up in the beginning of the season. You can't necessarily just shift before the end of the season. You've already got your seeds in the ground. Another issue is that, um, especially when it comes to commodities, individual c farmers can't influence the market. So each farmer um, who's growing corn, for example, can't say, well, I have this wonderful um, feed corn that's going to feed animals and it's, it's very different from your feed grain. Well, actually, they're all going to be seen as the same and no farmer is going to be able to demand a different price from the others. There are products that are differentiated where that's not the case, but, but that's true for commodities. And finally, farmers as a group are growing older and um, we need to have a replacement supply of farmers to grow our food for us. The second set of reasons for a need for governmental role in agriculture, it has to do with the environment. So there's an inherent tendency in agriculture toward overproduction. So every farmer has an incentive to basically produce as much as possible so they can get as much profit as possible. That It's in their individual interest to do that, but it's in nobody's group interest to have every farmer doing this because if, if all the farmers are doing that, then the prices go down, so that's not good for the farmers. So it's helpful to them to have something that, that helps manage that. And similarly, there's a tendency towards unsustainable practice um, in a lot of farming, and a lot of that has to do with a just the way that industry has evolved to seek the greatest possible yield at the lowest possible cost. And that often leads towards unsustainability, and so there's an opportunity and a need to protect the environment. By setting standards that affect everyone, that provides an opportunity to for farmers that want to do the right thing to be more likely to be able to afford to do the right thing. And finally, consumers. So we, we need farms to stay in business because we need them to produce our food. And we need to be able to afford food. We need it to be accessible. Um, and we need to be protected from some of the environmental and public health concerns that could come from production that would not necessarily um, be in our best interests. So for all these reasons, there's a need for a governmental role in agriculture. And especially that first set um, had something to do with the initial role for government in agriculture. So let me step into the history. And of course this history goes back, you know, millennia to when people first started farming. Let's start in the 1860s. We've got more than a century of federal government efforts to increase our levels of agricultural production. And one policy that was passed in 1862 was the Homestead Act and it gave homesteads to farmers um, that were further west from where they had originally lived, so it encouraged a westward expansion of farming. That was helped along by the Transcontinental Railroad. And another policy was, in 1862, established a system of land-grant schools, and those were schools, universities, colleges that were doing research on agriculture that could help improve agricultural production and methods. In 1914, there was another uh, major policy that, that had a lot of importance that developed the system of agricultural extension and university partnerships. And agricultural extension essentially is providing technical assistance to farmers to help them, um, you know, improve their ability to do their work. And again, this, this also played into the overall national goal of increasing agricultural production. So in the early 1900s, as time goes on, um, there's more and more technology available to farmers, and that makes them more and more able to exploit the land. So as they're moving west, they are um, plowing up the, the Midwest prairie lands, and so there's no more prairie cover, plant cover over that land. They're just um, plowing it up, putting plants in, not using cover crops. 
And so a lot of that soil grew increasingly damaged and erosion became a significant problem um, as farmers, you know, again, like I was saying, there's this tendency towards overproduction and high production and they were using their technology to expand that as much as they could. And as you've probably heard, um, one of the results of this, things kind of came to a head in the 1930s when there was a combination of all this soil erosion plus um, a, a, a season of high winds and drought, and it led to basically picking up a lot of the soil from the Midwest, um, the, the great topsoil from the Midwest, and depositing it all over the country. Farmers didn't necessarily have crops to sell. Um, they were hungry, they were angry. And consumers also were angry because the as scarcity grew, um, prices grew higher and consumers needed food as well. And as often happens when the population is getting angry, one way to prevent um, a really radical change is to develop a policy that um, addresses some of their concerns in a significant way. And so as part of the New Deal, um, they developed the Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1933. And one of the chief functions of this was price stabilization for both the farmers and the consumers. And one of the main pieces of developing this was the ever normal granary. The idea was that when there's surplus food, we put the surplus into the granary for storage. And then if we have a year when we have a low yield, then um, we can pull some of that out. And so it stabilizes the prices for the farmers and it stabilizes the prices for consumers. And there were other policies in there, like mandatory idling of certain land so that they wouldn't um, grow as much food and, and other pieces. And there were land and water conservation pieces in there as well. A number of other types of policies that were all connected to that. But this wasn't technically a farm bill. So technically the first farm bills came in 1938 and 1949. And what's very interesting about these policies is that um, they are considered to be the, the farm bill, the permanent legislation in the farm bill. So any every farm bill that we've passed since that time is basically a temporary farm bill that supplants the permanent legislation for this period of time until we until it expires and then we go back to the permanent. Um, and as you can imagine, things were quite different in 1938 and 1949. In recent years, there wasn't really a thought that it was very realistic that we would ever let the farm bill expire. but. As I'll discuss in Part C, in fact, that happened twice in the past two years. So every four to six years, there's another farm bill, and I'll just discuss a couple of the really more landmark farm bills. And one of those was in 1973. So all along, we've been focused on um, price stabilization and, and managing the supply so that we can manage the prices. and. By 1973, there was a new movement which was focused on let's grow as much as we possibly can. We can sell it overseas. We can push it domestically. Let's just, you know, we don't need all these little small farms that aren't really getting big yields. Let's get big farms. Let's um, plant fence row to fence row and get as much, as many crops as we can out of, out of the resources that we have. And at that point, we actually had the USDA Soil Conservation Service actually helping farmers to do things like drain their wetlands, remove the windbreaks, is pretty bizarre when you think about it in retrospect. And this this farm bill really um, played into, it, certainly the movement had already started, but this farm bill had a significant um, impact on furthering the decline of small farms and the growth of larger firms. Another thing that happened in the same farm bill um, was that the food stamps program was brought in. That had been started earlier, started and stopped, and it was brought in in the 1973 Farm Bill. And again, this was partly also a use for agricultural commodities that would partly also justify growing more of them, as well as, at this point, um, a lot of social concern about hunger. So fast forward to 1985 and 1990, and this was, these two were landmark farm bills in terms of development of environmental programs. And so a lot of the um, conservation programs came into the farm bill at this time, so, which I'll describe in more detail in the next section. Another thing that happened is the establishment of conservation compliance. The idea that if you're going to receive various subsidies or other payments through the farm bill, and you're farming on some environmentally sensitive land, then you have to 
um, comply with certain conservation requirements in order to be allowed to receive that money. You might say that the fence row to fence row types of policies that had started and grown since 1973 had something to do with the need for all these environmental programs. Okay, fast forward again, it's 1996, and this is another landmark farm bill. And this is a, an era not that different from some of what we have going on today, where there were high commodity prices, and this is also um, just after the contract with America, and in that period there was a, an idea, you know, let's get government out of um, a lot of things, including agriculture. So there was an aim to end government intervention in commodities. Not very far after that in the future, um, prices dropped in the economy. And suddenly, the government had to pay out a large amount of money in, in emergency payouts to farmers that didn't have any other way to support their income. And so um, there was a 50% increase by 1998. It doubled soon after that. And suddenly, we're not going to end our subsidies, we're going to increase them. And very ironically, the entire rise of farm subsidies like direct payments has its root in this effort to end government intervention in farming. And you will see this lovely picture. This actually is the only picture that I've been able to find of Freedom to Farm on the internet. The last set of farm bills that I wanted to describe as part of this history is also 1996, but really 2002 and 2008, there's this small but growing set of programs that advance goals of local and regional food systems and healthy foods. And I'll describe some of these in the next section. This is really a, another transition um, within the Farm Bill to, to change the types of foods and the types of food systems um, that are supported. And all of these programs, as in many farm bill programs, they start out very small and the goal is just get a foot in the door and then over time they may become um, larger with each su subsequent farm bill if you're lucky. So let me summarize what the history shows us. First, our farming system has been shaped by a long-term federal effort to increase agricultural production. I didn't say this earlier, but commodities were an early and thus a continued emphasis of these programs, in part because of their transportability and storability compared to more perishable foods. So these efforts to increase production have been in tension with, and sometimes in seesaw with, policies to protect us from ourselves by managing supply or the environmental impacts of overproduction. Additionally, much of the history of food assistance policy has to do with finding markets for surplus commodities. Today this motivation may be more covert, but it is not absent, even as the anti-hunger community and recognition of the challenges of hunger have become much more influential, a major influential player in farm bill politics. A third message from the history is that since at least the 1970s, there have been efforts to get government out of farming, and programs to subsidize farmers since at least that time have not been all that politically popular. Yet, efforts to remove support or safety net programs have often resulted in bringing in alternate programs to play that role as we'll see happening in this year's Farm Bill as well. Finally, programs with a more direct public health impact have been steadily growing in the Farm Bill, albeit not nearly as fast as many of us in public health would like to see. It can be frustrating to watch this incremental development, but colleagues who have been working effectively on Farm Bills for years have pushed the impatient among us, including me, to recognize the reality and long-term benefit of accepting this kind of incremental approach. Of course, state and local policies may promise more rapid changes, although not as widespread as the Farm Bill can achieve, and that's an important place to look for future opportunity.